Habakkuk chapter 3. I'll read our text this morning. This is the fifth message in this series of preaching through Habakkuk. Uh, We began with the perplexed prophet and then learned something of the expectant prophet and then the comforted prophet and then the believing prophet. And this morning we're going to look at Habakkuk the praying prophet. And our text will be the first two verses of chapter 3. Let's read God's word together. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shagayanoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years... Revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, I am so thankful for this book. There's nothing minor about this prophet. I'm thankful, Father, that you have preserved this word, even this prayer that we will be considering this morning, a psalm of Habakkuk, that you have kept it for us and that you have blessed us with this piece of revelation. And Father, I pray that you would give us understanding this morning that you would illumine our hearts and minds, that you would implant within us desires that are healthy and spiritual, desires that are for life and godliness, desires for revival. Father, work amongst us. Revive this work in the midst of the years. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it is good after four weeks to be back in Habakkuk this morning. We have come to the third and final chapter of this prophetic book. And in this third and final chapter, you're going to notice, if we can connect the dots to the four previous messages, you're going to notice that Habakkuk has a rather renewed disposition. He isn't the man he was in chapter 1. And why? Because God has spoken and everything now has changed. Morning, lighters. Good to see you all. So I want you to think for a moment, just to connect the dots here, to that final verse in the second chapter, Habakkuk 2.20 in which we read, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And if you remember, that was the final portion of the word of God in his second reply to the prophet Habakkuk. And he has now heard from God. He has heard the word of the Lord and he has responded in humility. Because in the opening chapter, in the midst of Habakkuk's complaint, I mean, we we do want to call it prayer. And I, of course, encouraged you to pray with that degree of honesty and transparency. But in the midst of his complaint, we were looking at a man whose heart was not quiet. He was a man in turmoil. The opening message was titled, The Perplexed Prophet. But in chapter 3, We will hear the language of a prophet at peace, a humbled prophet, and a praying prophet. When a man one day asked George Mueller the secret of his walk with God, here's how George Mueller responded, quote, there was a day when I died, utterly died died to George Mueller. His opinions, preferences, 
tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. And it seems as though Habakkuk has come through a similar experience. So much of his attention in the opening chapter was on himself. You remember Habakkuk 1 verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or verse 3, why do you make me see iniquity? So much of his attention had been on the wickedness around him, of course. Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Again, chapter 1, verse 3. Then chapter 1, verse 13. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? His attention was on all the evil that was bombarding he and his people. It was as though the law of God was silent, inactive, ineffectual. But now something has changed. His perspective in chapter 3 is totally different. He has died a kind of death, a death to self. And because of that, his whole perspective has changed. And it is this kind of death that each of us need to die as well. We need to be those believers whose eyes are not fixed on ourselves or the things around us. Instead, we have our gaze fastened on the Lord who is seated on his throne of grace. And when that happens, everything changes. Though circumstances remain the same, Everything about us, the way we think, the way we see things, the way we walk with God, it changes. So, Habakkuk, having recognized that the Lord indeed is in his holy temple, he now, when we come to chapter 3, offers up this prayer with renewed expectation that the Lord will hear and answer. And the fact that this prayer is documented for us in Scripture is quite wonderful. This prayer is a song. This prayer is a psalm. And that is exactly what we see in the opening verse of chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shagayanoth. And that language, that Hebrew word, is one that's hard to translate, so we're not even going to attempt to do so this morning. You, you read the best of commentators, and they'll ultimately say, we're not quite sure what Shagayanoth means. They see this language not just here in Habakkuk 3.1, but in five different psalms. So you ought to be relatively familiar with this word, though you and I don't really know what it means. But here we have this recorded prayer of Habakkuk the prophet to the Lord standing in the gap on behalf of his people as something of a prophetic intercessor. And he has documented this prayer on behalf of his people and for the sake of his people. This prayer in song form then would be something sung by other Israelites and likely a song that would have been sung during the actual exile for those 70 years in Babylon. It was recorded and documented for a purpose. Habakkuk is strengthening the hand of those just ones who will live by their faith for the difficult years to come. That's the context of this prayer in Habakkuk 3. And it's really a pretty amazing picture the Lord gives us here. Habakkuk has finally and fully, it seems, settled into the reality of God's justice 
and his chastening work to come. He has accepted God's wisdom in sending a nation even more wicked than Israel to destroy Israel. The turmoil and confusion within the man has ceased and been replaced by this settled conviction and firm trust. And now the prophet pins this prayer in order to lead others of his people into this same kind of help and perspective. He would help them as he has been so helped by Yahweh. And of course, this should be our attitude in work today, shouldn't it? Freely you have received, brethren, freely give. Let's begin to look now at this Psalm of Habakkuk, his prayer. Look with me at verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Well, what is the opening word? Of this prayer, set aside the single letter word O and tell me what that is. Lord. In the Hebrew, it's Yahweh. This is the Tetragrammaton. Anytime in your Bible you see Lord in small caps, it's Yahweh. And I want you to see that it's also the opening word in the final verse of this chapter. There's a technical term for it. It's relatively unimportant. But what is important is that Habakkuk, in authoring this prayer, in pinning these words, he's going to, in a sense, begin and end with Yahweh. You see that in verse 19. God, the Lord, is my strength. The covenantal and personal name of God then serves as bookends to Habakkuk's prayer. And as I said, that's rather significant. Why? Because Habakkuk has in his mind, as he prays, the covenant-keeping Yahweh. And, And here is really then a perfect picture of one who is pleading the promises of God, the God who has covenanted with us. And he's going to hold up God's own covenanting name to him and say, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Because you have promised to keep, preserve, protect, and revive your people. And this is where his prayer begins, Yahweh. And really there's two things that I want to say about these words that we read in verse 2. I want to point out that he is beginning with a recognition and then he moves into part two, his petition. And really with his petition is where we'll spend most of our time this morning. To begin with then, what is it that Habakkuk is acknowledging? What what has he recognized? Well, look at the first part of the verse again with me. O Lord. I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. From hearing to fearing. God had given him the report of what was soon to come. And I want you to think back to chapter 1 with me, verses 5 and 6, where God first responds to his prophet. And what does he say? Look out among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. And for the next several verses, he will describe the destructive nature of the Babylonian army. That's the work that God was about to do in Habakkuk's day. And the phrase that God spoke there 
in verse 5. I am doing a work. Which literally rendered would be, I am working a work. It's the same language that we see here in Habakkuk's prayer. O Lord, I have heard the report of you. And your work, O Lord, do I fear. But no more is Habakkuk afraid of the coming army of Babylon. No more. Instead, Habakkuk fears the Lord and his mighty work. Not the instruments, but the one who wields the instruments. And this is no servile fear that leaves Habakkuk hiding in a dark corner. This is no fear that causes the prophet to flee from God's presence. No, not at all, rather the opposite. This proper fear of the Lord sets this prophet to praying and pleading the promises of God. That's what the fear of God does. It's the beginning of wisdom, after all. He has now this heightened sense of the greatness of God and the severity of his holy judgments. Habakkuk has begun to grasp the sheer awesomeness of God's power because one who can wield an ungodly nation as a sword of judgment, that one is powerful. Habakkuk sees this now. And he's finally convinced, it seems, that the glory of God is far more important than his own little fears and concerns. That the name of God is far more glorious than anything he's holding on to in this life. And the great concern of Habakkuk now, and the great concern of you and me, if we're anything like him, is God's glory and God's name, even when it hurts. So, Habakkuk's posture here in chapter 3 is one of submission, humility, and longing. How is it with you, dear one? Submission, humility, and longing. How is it with you? We who claim to have a high view of God, how is it with us in the prayer closet? Well, this is what the prophet recognized. He is simply astounded at the power and majesty and wisdom of God. It reminds me a bit of the Apostle Paul's doxology in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. His, oh, excuse me, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. That's what he's recognized as he begins to pin this prayer. But let's now look at his petition. Because it's here that I want to camp out for the remainder of our time together this morning. And and the reason we need to camp out here is because we are living in days much like Habakkuk's day. If you are at all perceptive of the times and aware of the great evils that surround us, you likely recognize the judgment of God is near, even upon us. He he may not be sending a great army to crush our wicked nation tomorrow. Instead, it seems he's raised up a different kind of army, an army of cults and false religions and deceivers to tickle prideful and privileged American ears. But never has there been so many heretical movements in our land. And never have there been so many churches and yet so little truth. Lies are abundant. Lusts 
have saturated the country, leading to all manner of perversions. Violence is everywhere. More than 17,000 murders last year outside the womb. More than 800,000 murders last year inside the womb. I'm not sure there's ever been a time that our nation has been so dark and drunk with lust and sin. It's a moral freefall that confronts us in the world today. A moral freefall. And because of this, our nation is dying a slow death, saints. Apart from the intervention of God, America is a goner. And we see this throughout history, don't we? Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms rise, spread, and fall. It happened with Greece. It happened with Rome. It happened with the Assyrians. It happened with the Egyptians. And it may just happen in the West. Now, I know there are little pockets of life here and there. I trust there's one right here in Denton, Texas, to some degree. But so much of the modern church is lethargic, inactive, and ineffectual. I'm reminded of Bloody Mary in the 16th century who said she feared the prayers of a single man more than she feared invading armies. And who was that man? But John Knox. John Knox the reformer. And where are the John Knoxes of our day? Where is the fear of God anywhere? Where, where are the mighty men and women of God in the closet who's fearing our prayers. And so, the church, for the most part, by all appearances, has a love that is waxing cold. Prayers that have grown unconcerned. And again, apart from the intervention of God, the church will remain quiet, ineffective, sleepy, and yet, it was this way in Habakkuk's day. It has been this way in nearly every century mankind has known. But it was such a time as this that birthed such a prayer as this. So what is the essence of Habakkuk's prayer? It is a prayer for revival. This is certainly connected by the grand encouragement where we were four weeks ago from Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk is a just one, one living by his faith. And the believing prophet is doing what believers in God's sovereignty and power do. Habakkuk is well acquainted with the need of the hour. And there was great need. Ralph Erskine, preaching on this text, said the time of wrath is a sinning time. It's a sleeping time. It's a time of apostasy. It's a dead time. And this is what Habakkuk saw all around him. Apostasy, sin, sleepiness, death. And so he knows this. He knows that God's wrath is now fixated on Jerusalem and that the sword he is wielding is the Babylonians. It's coming, it's on the move. Yet what does he do? He prays. He petitions God. He pleads the promises. So, in his prayer we see Habakkuk emphasizing two important realities surrounding prayer and praying specifically for revival. Two important realities. Number one, God's sovereignty in revival. And number two, God's mercy in revival. 
that seems to be the two things that he has beaming through his prayer. And with God's character in view, Habakkuk begins his pleading. Look again at verse 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Don't just read that as printed text, but read it as a desperate cry from a needy believer who is firmly relying on God who is sovereign and merciful. Do you see his reliance here in this petition on God's sovereignty? He's asking God to do what only God can do. Revive your work, O Lord. Make your work known, O Lord. Why? Because man can't revive it. Man can't work it up. Man can't make it known. God, you have to do it or it will not be done. You must stretch forth your hand to save. You must rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. You must act. And this is the heart of his prayer. He prays for revival, for God to come down. Revival that originates with him. He is not looking to big stadiums filled with itching ears and eloquent preachers. He is not looking to marketing budgets and Easter egg hunts. He is looking to Yahweh, the covenant God, to come down. He cries out to God to revive his work among his people in the midst of his wrath. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that the very thing that is needed here and now? Psalm 144, verse 5. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains that they may smoke. Psalm 85, verse 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I don't know that I'm at a point in my life where there's been another moment where I need personal revival more than now. We, we need this. This is what Israel needed in Habakkuk's day. This is what America needs in our day. This is what Providence Chapel needs this day. Look at the language in Habakkuk's prayer in the 13th verse. A text we'll come to next time. But I want you just to see his heart being poured out here in prayer. Habakkuk 3.13 You went out for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. Laying him bare from thigh to neck. Do you hear his utter reliance upon God who is sovereign? Do you hear that? You went out, you crushed, you laid bare. You see, brethren, God must act. We can't just drum up revival today. And this is the way it has always been with revival. Why else would a freshly restored Peter stand up within weeks of his cowardly acts and begin to preach to a great crowd gathered in Jerusalem and suddenly 3,000 are converted. 
How else can such a thing happen but God? In September, on the 23rd day of 1857, an inner city missionary working through the Dutch Reformed Church in New York City began a weekly hour of prayer for businessmen to come together over the lunch hour and pray. 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., he distributed a few cards. And in the midst of discouragement on that day, September 23rd, he headed upstairs to a little room in the Dutch Reformed Church and began to pray. 30 minutes later, nobody else was with him. And then he heard footsteps coming up the stairs. And a man joined him. By the end of that hour, six total men had gathered for prayer. By the end of the time, those six men said, let's meet again. And the following week, they met again. But this time, there were 15 to 20 that gathered for prayer. The following week, it was 30 to 40 men that gathered for prayer. From that meeting onward, they committed to meet daily for prayer, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. daily. The agenda was simple. They would pray for the salvation of souls. There was some singing, maybe an occasional brief exhortation. That was September 1857. By the start of the year 1858, that room was so crowded they began to hold three simultaneous prayer meetings on three different floors in the largest rooms on those floors of that Dutch Reformed church. And from that church, another meeting was then birthed in a large theater in New York City, which 30 minutes prior to the first meeting, the theater was filled to capacity. Theodore Kyler, pastor of the 19th Street Church in New York, said, quote, he was struck with the earnestness of petitions for the descent of God's Spirit on our city. The local newspaper editor, Horace Greeley, who worked for the New York Tribune, sent a reporter during that 12 o'clock hour on horse and buggy to ride to as many of these prayer meetings as he could and document the size of the crowds that were gathering. In one hour, he could only get to 12 prayer meetings that were now gathering, but he counted more than 6,000 men. According to eyewitnesses, by the end of six months' time, these noontime prayer meetings were attracting 10,000 businessmen, all of them confessing their sins and praying for revival. From New York City, it began to spread to other cities. In such cities as Cleveland and St. Louis, thousands of people packed downtown churches three times per day just to pray. There were 6,000 people in attendance at a large church in Pittsburgh. In Washington, D.C., there were daily prayer meetings held at five different times to accommodate the crowds. The effects were astounding. Many ministers of all denominations began having nightly services, preaching evangelistic sermons, simply opening the doors to lead people to Christ. People were converted sometimes to the tune of 10,000 weekly in New York alone. An Episcopal church bishop, Charles McElvain, he writes this, quote, I rejoice in the decided conviction that this is the Lord's doing. Unaccountable by any natural cause, Entirely above and beyond what any human device or power could produce. An outpouring of the Spirit of God upon God's people. Quickening them to greater earnestness in His service. And upon the unconverted to make them new creatures in Christ Jesus. It is estimated that over the two years or so of this revival of prayer... Approximately one to two million 
were converted to Christ at a time when our nation's population was a mere 30 million. It is a sovereign act of God like that that is needed in our day. And so often, dear ones, God has done this kind of extraordinary work in the midst of prevailing darkness. Think of the Reformation. The condition of the world and the church in the 15th and 16th century was pitiful. Alexander VI, Rome's pope at the turn of the 16th century, was a perverted man. Maybe the most perverted man among the Roman popes. He filled the Vatican with at least nine illegitimate children and didn't hesitate to put those children in places of influence and power. He held large orgies in the Vatican, at times hiring as many as 50 prostitutes for these perverted parties. This was Luther's day. This was in the midst of Luther's own awakening. By the time of 1517 and the birth of the Reformation, it was Pope Leo X who ruled over the church. He was remembered for saying, God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Another perverted pope in Rome's history. The church was in darkness, people were ignorant and superstitious and evil. But it was from that darkness that God birthed the Reformation revival. It was so with the Great Awakening, wasn't it? When England was a spiritual desert and God raised up men like George Whitfield, the Wesleys, Howell Harris, and other men who lit two continents on fire for the gospel. This is how God works, He's sovereign. And how desperate is our situation today? But do you even see it that way, church? Because until we do, until we get some sense of the desperate nature of the times, we won't pray in desperation. So I urge you and me both to look to our sovereign king who sits upon that throne of grace and plead with him for revival. It's sovereign, a sovereign act of God. And still, we must consider God's mercy in revival as well. And here is where we will finish this morning. As much as revival is a sovereign act, it is likewise a merciful act. Act, meaning full of mercy. Habakkuk pleads for that which is central to God's character. In wrath, remember mercy. He wrestles with God in prayer, calling him by his covenant name, Yahweh, holding up to him in prayer his own name and mercy. Reminds me of Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. But with you, there is forgiveness. But, but with you, God, there is mercy, plentiful mercy. We do not ask God to send revival our way because we have somehow merited it. God forbid. Never could we do such a thing. We only ask on the basis of mercy. We, we don't want what we deserve. We want what God can freely and mercifully give. As Lloyd-Jones said, 
We have nothing to say, nothing to ask, but that thou shouldest act like thyself, and in the midst of wrath shouldest have pity on us. We are to be those storming the mercy seat in times like this. God, please remember mercy, mercy, Lord, mercy. This is Moses interceding for the people of Israel on their refusal, on the heels of their refusal to go into the promised land and take it. We heard Jeff on this last Sunday. And in Numbers 14, Moses begins to intercede for the people. And now, Please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Verse 19. Please, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. In wrath, Lord, remember mercy. Please pardon, Lord. This is the foundation of our plea. Isn't it? The mercy of God. Not, not the greatness of men, but the great mercy of God. Not what my hands have done, Lord, but we ask you to do what only your hands can do, Lord. You are merciful. You delight in saving sinners. In revival, your glory is manifest in a special manner. Come, Lord. In mercy, rend the heavens and come down. Because we need reviving, dear church. When we are sleepy, when we are downcast, when we are confronted by the calamity of comfort every day of our lives, we need revival. And so we plead with God for this particular mercy that only he can give. Yes, revival is an act of God's mercy. Yes, revival is a sovereign act of a merciful God. But God is pleased to use means, isn't he? Church history tells us, it seems, in large letters that the typical means by which God brings about revival is prayer. And that's what our brother, our prophet brother, begins to do here. He begins to pray. I challenge any one of you to study church history and find one revival that wasn't birthed in prayer. Whether six businessmen, a group of pastors, two women, whatever it might be, people come together and pray. And God sovereignly, mercifully begins to act. We must give ourselves to prayer, brothers and sisters. Prayer for revival, prayer for mercy. Let me close with one more account of revival in the late 18th century at Hamden City College in Virginia. This was approximately the year 1879. And it began with one student of that relatively unknown college in Virginia who picked up a little book by a Puritan young man, Joseph Eline. The book was titled, Alarm to the Unconverted. And he began to read that little book, which I would commend to any of you, one of the best evangelistic booklets 
time has provided us. He read it and began to share some of the things that he was gleaning with two other students at Hamden Sydney College. Those three students began to meet for prayer. Out of fear from being persecuted by their fellow students, they would go out into the woods for prayer. But one day the weather was bad. They stayed indoors. By this time, a fourth student had joined them and begun praying. And as they were praying, they were spied upon by a hostile student. The word got out. They were harassed and shunned. And one student, so hostile against these four young men praying in the college, takes his complaint to the president of the college hoping to have them expelled from the university. And the president heard the complaint, and he replied with tears streaming down his face, God has descended. I will join them. At the next meeting, the president joined them, and a remarkable revival swept through the college. More than half of the students of that college were converted and began regularly attending prayer meetings which continued through the end of the 19th century. The revival then spread to other colleges and universities as well, such as Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton. Many, many students all throughout New England were coming to Christ and crying out for revival at God's mercy seat. Dear church, will you pray for your nation? Will you ask God to revive his church? Do you long for such a movement of God's mercy in our day? Honestly answer those questions and then begin to pray as Habakkuk prayed. Revive your work, O Lord, in the midst of these dark years. In wrath, remember mercy. Let's pray. Father, everything that we do today, everything that we say, everything that we hear, it's entirely inadequate unless it be that the Spirit of God so takes the things that we hear, the things that we say, and makes them adequate. Father, it is your voice we have come to hear today. And I pray that in this hour, we would have heard something of the voice of our God. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Revive us. In Jesus' name, amen.